Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, Almighty and everlasting God, who has safely brought us to the beginning of this day, defend us in the same with thy mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings being ordered by thy governance may be righteous in thy sight, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, we beseech thee mercifully to receive the prayers of thy people who call upon thee, and grant that they may both perceive and know what things they ought to do, and also may have grace and power faithfully to fulfill the same, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O God, who by the leading of a star didst manifest thy only begotten Son to the Gentiles, mercifully grant that we who know thee now by faith may after this life have the fruition of thy glorious Godhead, through the same of thy Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. Okay, so we will be in Isaiah this morning. So it's Isaiah 42, beginning in verse 1. <clears throat> Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights, is God speaking. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations he will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth, and the coastlands wait for his law. Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk <clears throat> who walk in it. <laughs> I am the Lord, I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison house, those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I will give to no other nor my praise to carved idols. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I will tell you of them. So, uh, I was thinking of this analogy, and then I remembered that there was one here. So, I found this in a closet, and then was shocked to learn from Emma that it still does occasionally get used. Okay, so this is a bygone thing now in school but you're familiar with this oh, yeah. relic exactly. and monstrosity, right? She you know? Oh, boy. I know. I know what it is. Oh, boy. All right. Well, I was hoping somebody would not have seen an old-school projector. So, uh, so when I was in school, it was before anybody had computers and projectors in their classrooms, uh, we had these. Okay, so you know what a transparency is. So it's a clear paper that you would put on it, right? Uh, so the idea is, through this system of mirrors, say I've got a whiteboard behind me or a screen or something, I'm projecting the shadow. So the paper is clear. Uh, but you, these are just blank transparencies, but you'd also have uh, documents teachers would use with the projectors, clear plastic reproductions of assignments or textbook pages, pictures, diagrams, graphs, you know, whatever else, right? Uh, there was a special kind of marker you would use. If I'd have found one of those markers, we could do the few things I'm going to write on the board on here and really kick it old school the whole way, but uh, I don't have any of those markers. Uh, so I remember in my Algebra two class when I was in ninth grade, uh, our teacher every day would project up uh, handouts that we had and, and we would work through them together. And as we would do them together, she would write 
it's kind of nifty as a teacher not to be able to have to not to have to write big on the board. I guess I mean she would kind of do the assignment here uh, on the transparency version of the assignments uh, as we worked through them together. She'd show us the work. She'd fill in the blanks. Uh, and and it was actually already kind of old school at that point for me because we had had a teacher in the eighth grade with a projector, like in our sense, uh, who projected his computer screen. And he had PowerPoints for every class, so that kind of blew everybody's mind. This guy's from the future. Uh, but anyway, old projectors, transparencies, strange thing. Uh, but I thought of all of this and that whole period and this whole experience reading this passage because a transparency uh, lets you, as we've said, add to existing documents, pictures, for all to see. Uh, lets you fill in the blanks for all to see. Uh, but it also lets you combine and, and overlap pictures, diagrams, graphs, whatever, uh, see through so you can stack them. So we'd see lots of overlapping things sometimes in math as well. Uh, they let you see one thing through something else. So something like that is at work, I think, in the way that the New Testament handles this passage uh, and passages like it from Isaiah. Uh, the New Testament picks up this passage and, and fills in Jesus, so to speak. Uh, it, it, it completes the passage in a way that you might complete an assignment by filling in an answer. And the New Testament invites us to see Jesus uh, and his work in the world and our salvation through the lens of this passage. Uh, this is the thing that all of that is, is laid on and exists within. Does that make sense? So, so we really only understand this passage when we see Christ in it. And we really only understand Christ and what he has done when we look at him through this passage. So uh, keep your finger there and look with me at Matthew chapter 12. Somebody want to do a little reading for us? Okay. Uh, did you read Matthew 12, 15 to 21? Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there, and many followed him, and he healed them all, and ordered them not to make him known. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, with whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench, until he brings justice to victory, and in his name the Gentiles will hope. Okay, so by the way, the thing that Jesus is aware of at the beginning of verse 15 is from verse 14, it's that the Pharisees are conspiring against him to destroy him. But there it is. This is our passage. Jesus fulfilling our passage. So how so? Why does Matthew say that? What, uh, what do we see here in this passage from Isaiah 42? What do we learn? So looking back at it, first we should note that our passage is one of a group of passages from Isaiah uh, together called the Servant Songs. Just a familiar idea of this group of passages, the servant songs in Isaiah. Uh, they all describe the Lord's chosen servant, this figure of the servant, uh, and his experiences and his mission. So I'll jot those passages down for future reference. This is one of them. Also 49, 1 to 7. And 50, 1 to 10, give or take a couple of verses. And then 52, 13 to 53, 
12. And the question about these passages, if you're just reading Isaiah, uh, is, well, who is this figure? And at one level, the figure of the servant is Israel, uh, the people God has chosen to serve him and, and through whom he has promised to work in the world for its restoration. Uh, but there has to be more that's going on because in some places the servant actually acts on behalf of Israel, for Israel. Uh, the earliest church saw these passages as pointing toward and fulfilled in Christ, the Lord's chosen servant, uh, through whom God works in the world for its salvation, who represents and acts to benefit Israel. Uh, one of the first things we notice in our passage is that it's Trinitarian. Uh, so the Trinity is both a simple concept and uh, an almost unspeakably philosophically complex one, that, there, that, that God is one God in three persons, right? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And part of what makes the concept tricky is that that word isn't used in the Bible. The word Trinity comes later. But we see the idea come up again and again. And this is one of those places in our verse 1. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. So the Father speaking about the Son, sending him the Spirit to empower him to do his work. And part of why this passage is appointed today, uh, the first Sunday of Epiphany, is because the first Sunday of Epiphany um, commemorates Jesus' baptism. Uh, and so our other reading, one of the other readings from Mark, when Jesus is baptized, uh, sort of echoes this passage, quotes this passage too, and so is also densely Trinitarian. In Mark chapter 1, verse 10, we read, When Jesus came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. Again, uh, almost in these words, the Father speaking to the Son, sending him the Spirit to empower him to do his work. So, the whole trinity at work. Now, <clears throat> what's this language in verses 2 and 3? So he will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break. In other words, a damaged plant, he, he just barely hanging on, he won't knock over. Uh, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. A lamp or a candle just barely flickering, he won't blow it out. Uh, what what might that mean? You think he's not here to take anyone out, but more give life to people who are struggling. Mm -hmm. his, his work isn't destructive. Yeah, I like that way of putting it. He's not here to take anyone out. He's not as much of a political savior as he is a soul. Sort of. Yeah. Okay, so yes. To the, Let's see, where were we here? The language about the reed and the wick. I think you're on the right track. I think, uh, this is the way that I would put it. It's kind of the first thing you said. I think, at least in part, the idea is that these lines describe uh, the, the, the gentleness of Jesus' mission uh, with people. The peacefulness of it. Uh, its quietness, its subtlety. Um, it's simplicity. Uh, after all, this actually is the piece of our passage that's quoted by, by Matthew. And when Matthew says it's fulfilled, is when Jesus has gone off to be by himself after telling people not to make him famous. Uh, in one way, and this is part of the point of, of one of the other servant songs in, in chapter 53, uh, 
uh, in one way it's important that Jesus was a regular guy. Uh, so yes, he has a divine nature as well as a human nature. And in his divine nature, he is God, the second person of the Trinity. But in his human nature and in his life on earth, uh, he was kind of a regular guy, right? He wasn't rich. He didn't have lots of things if he had anything. He didn't have a home. Uh, part of the mystery of God's work in Christ is that he comes in such um, normalcy and such vulnerability. Uh, we talked about that, was it last week? Meredith brought up thinking of Advent and Christmas and, uh, and, and Jesus, God in person, being, being a baby, right? Uh, God comes in Christ in simplicity. And he does miraculous things, uh, but even his miracles, uh, he, he does simply. It's, it's, he's, he's healing, he's giving to people, to real, regular people uh, on the ground, so to speak. Jesus' miracles aren't, aren't big, flashing displays of what we might think of as divine power. Uh, and so all of this poses two challenges to us, I think. Uh, first, to reconsider what true power is. God, of course, is powerful, all-powerful, made everything, can do everything. Uh, but when God acts, when God acts climactically in his Son to save us from sin and death, to set all of creation, right, uh, he doesn't, he doesn't come taking people out. He doesn't send in the tanks. He doesn't ride in, in, in physical strength and in violence. And that is what people in Jesus' day had expected to see. That's what they hoped the Messiah would be like, a warrior. But Jesus was not like that. So, so how do we think of uh, power? What is real power? What is real strength? Godly power. Godly strength. Uh, it, isn't, it isn't the ability to get your way by force. Uh, it's the power of righteousness, uh, of truth, of love. God's love uh, is, is more truly powerful to transform uh, than our own strength and violence. And secondly, relatedly, I think we're challenged to reimagine uh, how it is God seems to like to work in the world. Uh, we often are just like the people in Jesus' day when we look for God to do things in the world, in our lives. Uh, Christians make the same mistake that so many atheists and agnostics do when they look for proof or evidence of God, God at work in the world. And you kind of go, well, I, you know, I don't see him doing anything. You know, there's no big, crazy, dramatic, uh, miraculous displays of divine power going on in my life or anybody else's I can see. Uh, where's the thunder and the lightning? booming voices, uh, you know, where's the drama, where's all the godlike stuff, uh, and yeah, there is some of that in scripture, Jesus' baptism, which we just read, might be a little like that, but it seems as though God's preferred way of working in the world is through, again, regular people doing small things, being obedient, learning to be righteous, to be truthful, to love. Uh, God, God does not call us to be heroes. Uh, he calls us to be obedient, to follow him. So <clears throat> this passage, Isaiah 42, as we've said, is... is a lens through which we should look at and understand not only Jesus, but our own salvation. 
And this is something else uh, I think we sometimes tend to think about unbiblically. I think a lot of Christians, in my own experience anyway, uh, like, again, a lot of non-Christians, imagine that what salvation is all about is going to heaven when you die. So the point of life is uh, get saved and then just wait to die and go to heaven. Uh, Now, I'm not knocking heaven. That's part of the picture. But listen to how God describes what his servant, Christ, will do for his people here. Uh, It says he will bring justice in verse 1 and again in verse 4. In verse 5, he gives us breath, in other words, life, and the spirit, new life. Uh, In verse 6 and following, Christ, uh, who is righteous, who walks with the Lord, uh, who is given to us as a covenant, in other words, God's promise, as a light, as healing, he will, in verse 7, bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. Now, does that mean that Christ's work is only for the wrongly imprisoned? <clears throat> no, it's a metaphor, right? Uh, we are those in prison, uh, in a dungeon, in darkness, and Christ leads us out to freedom and light. Our salvation, Christ's work in us, isn't just about what happens when we die. It's also about our lives here now and every aspect of them, which is why I'm a little tentative to go all the way to the point of saying, you know, Jesus saves us spiritually or our souls, but um, isn't a political figure. I know what you mean, Jack. It's true. He's not a political leader in his day. He, He tries hard not to be and to make sure that people understand that. At the same time, our own uh, sanctification, uh, our own learning how to uh, become holy and see the world the way that God does and Christ teaches us to, will mean thinking about those kinds of things, Christian. So, you know, our Christianity does affect our politics as much as it affects any other area of our lives. And I know you weren't saying that it doesn't, but that's, yeah. Um, we're saved. Uh, we're saved not just from hell then. Uh, we're saved from hell now, from the hell of our sins, uh, the dungeon, the darkness that sin is. And Jesus saves us from our sins, and our being saved, our being sanctified, made like Him, our growing up in Christ means being taken by Him to freedom. Uh, and into the light of justice and truth and righteousness because, as God says in verse 9, the former things have come to pass and new things I now declare. We're given new life, new freedom in Christ. So finally, uh, I'd say if you want to dig deeper this week uh, into, into this passage, into these ideas, Um, Look at these other passages, the other servant songs. They will be familiar to you, uh, because like this one, they're quoted in the New Testament. If you have a reference Bible, uh, chase down all the references, all the places uh, these passages are quoted in the New Testament. And do what we've done this morning with this one and see how these passages are fulfilled. What is the point being made? in each of the New Testament quotations of these passages. That would be a great study. Uh, And this epiphany season, uh, as as we continue to think of Christ incarnate in flesh on earth at work for us to save us, uh, may we see him in the fuller way that these passages invite us to. Uh, May we rethink power rethink how God works, rethink the fullness of our own salvation in light of these prophecies, these promises, Uh, and may we listen to Christ through whom God has spoken to us. 
Almighty God, who pourest out on all who desire it the spirit of grace and of supplication, deliver us when we draw nigh to thee from coldness of heart and wanderings of mind, that with steadfast thoughts and kindled affections we may worship thee in spirit and in truth through Jesus Christ our Lord. 